Okay, we good? All right. So, uh, this week I was, you know, you teach a lesson and then you kind of go back later and go, I don't, I think there might have been more to that. And I was looking at this prophecy of Zechariah and he said that the Lord will raise up a horn of salvation for you. And I, it's just not adding up. And I, I, I looked up the word horn and the Hebrew word is Karen. One of Job's names, daughter's name was Karen. And I looked up the meaning, and it has several meanings. It, it, the Karen was the horn on the altar. It was the horn of oil that Samuel anointed David with. But it also means a ray of light. And when I come in, she's already picking on me with this great big smile about where I park. And I'm thinking, you know what? Names are your destiny, and I think that you're to be a ray of light in a world of darkness. So thank you, Karen. Okay. So, uh, last week we, okay, last week we uh, looked at 90% of the life of Jesus and all the words he spoke, age, newborn till his ministry. Today we're going to look at when he started his ministry with John the Baptist and his temptation in the desert, Okay. And uh, with that, I think come a lot of questions. I mean, why was John a Nazarite from birth? Why did he have hair all over his body and dress in camel's hair and wear a leather belt? And why did he say he was baptizing for the remission of sins? How could John be baptizing for the remission of sins? Did John invent baptism? Did they do baptism before John? We know that at the day of Pentecost, anybody remember how many people were saved? 3,000. And then they said they were all baptized. Last year, Foothills Church baptized 45 people in the Malala River. And they had two pastors baptizing and people helping the people in and out to speed up the process. And it still took one and a half hours. Average three minutes for them to come into the water, confess their faith, and be baptized and leave the water. So if you want to do the math, on the day of Pentecost, it took 150 hours to baptize 3,000 people, six and a quarter days. How was that possible? Are we missing something? Is there something going on here? And so we find John. Why was he in the wilderness? Why not at the temple telling the people about Messiah? What was he doing out there? Why was he at Bethany beyond the Jordan? There's a lot of places he could baptize. He did baptize in three different places. Um, But this particular time, he's at Bethany beyond the Jordan. Why that spot? Remember I've told you, By the way, Jurgen made some really strong coffee and I drank a cup of it before the sermon, so we're really going to get with it today. You need to blame Marion on that. (laughs) So why Bethany beyond the Jordan? Why John? Why Jesus being baptized when he didn't need remission of sins? Why? um, This is, there's no way to type. Why does this keep falling down? I have too much weight on it. We'll We'll solve that. Or I'll be on my knees again. There we go. Why did the heavens break open and a spirit like dove come and and land upon him? I think this is going to work. Yeah. Oh, you're going to help me out. There we go. Thank you. We got it. We need more here next week. No, just kidding. (laughs) And then he came up out of the water and this, this voice from heaven... Did that ever happen? Was that the first time it ever happened? Who heard it? What did he say? Why did he say what he said? And then immediately he goes into the wilderness for 40 days. Why 40 days? Why the wilderness? Tempted by the devil. Why those three temptations? So it's okay to ask questions about Scripture. In fact, I'm finding a lot of times people avoid the Gospels. They're nice to read. You kind of get the surface, but 
it raises a lot of questions sometimes. So when you dig into the context and the culture and the geography, you start to understand some of the context. Okay. So I thought it was interesting. I was reading this 100-year uh, history of Canyon Creek Bible Fellowship. And right off it says that it was a September Saturday, 1914, and a pony-driven cart was bouncing down the dusty road through the Clarks County on its way to Colton from Oregon City. The cart carried a man named J.O. Stats. The month before, three ladies from Colton, Mrs. Elizabeth Dix, Mrs. Marietta Montrose Freeman, and Mrs. Hazel Freeman, had attended the Advent Christian Camp at Camp Troutdale. While there, they were requested that they requested that a minister be sent to Colton to hold some meetings. Elder J. O. Stats agreed to go to Colton, and now his journey was almost done. At the foot of Putts Hill, Elder Stats met a man carrying the mail. He later learned to know and love this mail carrier, known as Victor Hill. Elder Stats inquired him of the direction to the home of Mrs. Dix, and Mr. Hill piloted him to her home. On the next day, the Lord's Day. About 30 people gathered at the old Colton schoolhouse to hear Elder Stats preach from the text in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. He preached again on the evening the subject of faith. Um, and it goes on to talk about how this church was founded. But that was the first sermon in the old schoolhouse in Colton, Oregon, and that's the message that John is going to be preaching in the wilderness, be baptized for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins. And Elder Stats on that day was preaching out of Hebrews 9.22. One can say that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So how could baptism be giving remission of sins unless without the shedding of blood? And we'll get to that. That is a great question. So let's go to the text today. Um, John was in the wilderness. Oh, great. Da, da, da. Ha, <laughs> we got you. All right. Remember, John was a Nazarite from birth. What did that mean? Couldn't drink from anything from the grape through the vine. Couldn't touch anything dead. And couldn't cut his hair. So what would John have looked like by age 30? By the way, he turned 30 about six months before this. Remember how much older John is than Jesus? Mary went to see Elizabeth. She was six weeks pregnant. A priest began their duties at age 30. Six months prior, John's in the wilderness baptizing, preaching repentance, and now six months later, Jesus is going to come to him because Jesus is 30, and a rabbi started their ministry at age 30. Very interesting. So that's where we're at. Um, John was living in the wilderness. People were known, some of these holy men of the day were known as Hasidim. They often didn't shave their hair. They had a Nazarite vow. They lived a life of poverty. They ate the drippings from the date palms. You go out in Jericho, out in the wilderness, there's all these groves of date palms, and the, they drip, and they called that date honey. And anybody could have that, just don't touch the dates. And there were all these trees in the wilderness called locust trees, and they had these pods on them, they're green when they're growing, and then they land on the ground, and this is what they look like. And please don't take a bite of this, but if you do, it's chocolate-flavored cardboard is what it tastes like. <laughs> it's a carob. It's where we get carob. And the Hasidim would eat these things because that was about as hungry as you could be. That was about as low as you could be. And you remember the prodigal son is feeding the pods to the pigs, this is what he's feeding to the pigs, and he wished that he could eat them. So this is, you're welcome to look at this later. I'll give this to Nathaniel. There we go. You can pass it around. And um, this is what John's doing. He's 
has a reputation. People knew about his birth. They knew he was out there. They knew something was going on. But something else, um, let's see, something else. This particular year, 26 to 27 AD, was the end of the 69th year of Daniel's 70 years. And remember, Daniel said, on the 70th week, Messiah will come. The people knew that 483 years ago, King Cyrus had said, go back and rebuild Jerusalem and the streets and the city. And these people know this is the year that Daniel prophesied Messiah would come. And there was this idea amongst the people that if the people could be found pure enough and righteous enough and holy enough, Messiah would come and be a political leader. They said there's two kinds of messiahs we might see. Messiah ben David, son of David, or Messiah ben Joseph, son of Joseph. Remember, Joseph was taken captive. He was um, abused by his, uh, the caravan taking him to Israel. He was in jail. Uh, there was even something about a third day there. But, uh, and then he was brought back to reign second in charge next to Pharaoh over all Israel but he had a humble beginning. The sages said that if Messiah comes, Mount, if we are found worthy when Messiah comes, he will come victorious on a horse. But if we're found unworthy, he'll come humble, mounted on a donkey. And they said this before Messiah came. And so many people are, there's this messianic fever. And they want to be found pure and ready when Messiah comes. Okay, So they're doing this thing called immersion in a mikvah. And all around Israel are these stone pools of water with steps into them. And they had to have living water. It couldn't just be well, uh, it couldn't be, it had to be water from a, a running source. So they bring this water in from rivers, etc., or it would flow from rain and flow into these pools. Uh, you go to the little town of Chorazin, right in the middle of town, there's a, the remains of a mikvah pool. Um, and the people would, were at this time obsessed with purity. They wanted to be like the bride to the to the bridegroom when he comes and to be found pure. And next week's sermon, I think is what, we started this series through the Gospels months ago, weeks ago. How ironic is it that next week the, the message is on the wedding at Cana? And you can put on the reader board, did Jesus turn water to wine? That ought to be a catch, right, Marion? <laughs> We'll have some people here have strong opinions both ways, probably. But I want to look at the Jewish wedding next week and how fun it is that Grace and Colby are getting married the day before I teach on the Jewish wedding. And John uh, calls himself the, 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 um, the best man of the bridegroom and calls Jesus the bridegroom. We're going to look at that a little bit today, and it will continue that. It's ironic that John includes the miracle of wine to, water to wine in Cana, right after he talks about John uh, coming and baptizing Jesus. Um, I mean, John the Baptist doing that. So, this will be fun. But um, people in this day, before they would even go into the temple in Jerusalem, they would self-immerse. You would walk, these would be covered. There was no, no nudity, and, and the women had theirs, the men had theirs, or they would wear clothing. And they would uh, go in, many times they would put their clothes to the side, immerse completely under the water, and then come back out, dry off, didn't take long in Israel, clothe again and leave. They have found over a hundred of these pools around the Temple Mount. They have decided that the Pool of Shalom, like almost the size of a football field with steps into it all around, was probably a giant baptismal immersion pool. Or maybe just wash hands and feet. I don't know what they did, but they had an idea that if they had had touched anything impure, um, 
possibly gotten impure in any way, before they could go in the presence of God, they would self-immerse. The bride before her wedding wanted to be pure for her bridegroom, and she would also immerse in a mikvah um, before the wedding. And we'll talk about that next week. But if they think there was probably at least 300 baptismal pools around um, the Temple Mount. Peter says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Poosh! Nine minutes le- or 30 minutes later, 3,000 people came back, all having been immersed in the name of Jesus at the command of Peter. The other thing that the mikvah pool was used for is if Jürgen decides, I want to convert to Judaism. He has to say that I am willing to be a son of the commandment and do my best to follow every one of the commandments. And then he has to immerse in a mikvah pool. And it was said that this is symbolic of dying and being buried and being resurrected. And they believed that when you a, a Gentile went into the mikvah pool, he w- died and he came out genetically a son of Abraham. And so this was used for conversion to Judaism. Do you see why Nicodemus... And, and it was said that he was born again. Did you think we invented born again? Do you remember? And we're going to study that in two weeks. Nicodemus said, Jesus said, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus said, you must mean enter my mother's womb because my father is already Abraham. I don't need to do this. I don't need to convert. And Jesus said, yeah, you need to be born again again. So we're going to, this idea of immersion didn't start with John and born again didn't start with us and and there's a lot of culture here so John is wading into the river in Jordan and people are coming to him Uh, let's read let's go to Mark chapter 1 and let's just read I picked Mark because it's the shortest there's um, Matthew 3 and 4 have the story. Luke 3 and 4 have the story. And John 1 has the story. Um, but Mark, let's start reading at verse 1. This is the f- Remember that Genesis starts out with the word the genealogy of or the origin of or the genesis of. John says in the beginning, better sheet, the beginning. Mark says right here, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Messiah, Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. They believed that Elijah went to heaven in a chariot of fire and he would return to introduce the Messiah. So they were expecting Elijah They're expecting the Messiah to come this year, but before the Messiah comes, Elijah has to come. And how would you recognize Elijah if he came? Um, Samuel, uh, or 2 Kings 1.8 says, the, the, uh, the king said, how do you know it was Elijah? Well, we know it was Elijah because he was a hairy man with a leather girdle bound about his loins. And the king said, that's Elijah. So you might get a clue if John's wearing camel's coat or camel's hair garment and he's hairy and he's got a leather belt and he's in the wilderness and, G- and, and the prophecy to Zechariah was he will be like Elijah. And Jesus said, if you care to believe it, John was Elijah. And so people are see- identifying John as Elijah in the desert. And they're coming out not for forgiveness of their sins necessarily at that moment, but for purity reasons, to be ready so that Messiah can come. Because Messiah is going to come and we want to be ready and we want to be pure and we want to be without sin. And I believe that when John was baptizing for remission of sins, he was baptizing to prepare people for the coming of the Messiah who would shed his blood who would give, that would give remission of sins. So um, I, think that's, I think that's what John was talking about. We'll look at that a little bit more. Okay, going on. 
John the Immerser, the baptizer, the Baptist, appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to where he was, along with all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being immersed by John in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. And John was wearing a a camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate mostly locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me is one coming who is mightier than I, and I am not even fit to kneel down and untie the lace of his sandals. I have immersed in water, but he will immerse in the Holy Spirit. Now at this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was immersed by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens split open, and the Spirit like a dove was descending upon him. And a voice from heaven said, You are my Son, whom I love, and you I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit directed him to go in the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by the accuser. And he was with wild beasts and angels, and angels were ministering to him. There is so much to unpack here. So much that John's setting the stage for. Um, We have people coming. The other versions go into, John turns to the Pharisees and says, you brood of vipers, why are you coming to me? You are supposed to be the leaders of Israel. You are supposed to be bringing them back to purity and repentance. And instead, you're here with your hands on your hips, judging what's going on here when people want to return. I remember on one of our trips to um, up north of Galilee, there was this little fudge brown snake about this long, all curled up, and he had a little white diamond on his head, and he was so cute. And I almost grabbed him to tease the girls in the group, because I know, but I'm kind of afraid of snakes too. So we just poked him with a stick and played with him and pushed him off. Later, we're looking at our pictures, and some uh, buddy said, that's a viper. And we looked it up, and sure enough, the viper is a brown snake with a diamond on his head. And the baby vipers are the most deadly form of snake on the earth. And that very next day we're at the Dead Sea and somebody reaches in their bag to get something and there's a viper crawled in the bag and it bit him and he died before they could get him to the hospital. So John says, you brood of vipers. You are the most deadly thing on the planet of the earth and why are you coming out here and saying, well, we're sons of Abraham. We don't need to repent and be baptized because we're automatically in. And John says, no, the axe is at the root of the tree and the tree that doesn't bear fruit is going to get chopped down and it's going to get burned up. No, it's like chaff and wheat and we're filtering out the chaff and we're keeping the wheat and you are like the chaff and you're going to get burned up. by a fire that can't be quenched. Very interesting. We'll we'll touch on that in the future. We don't have time today. But I promise you. So all these people are coming, and then comes Jesus. And John says, you should baptize me. And Jesus says, no, you need to do it for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of rightness. John wasn't baptizing Jesus so his sins could be forgiven. But Jesus also might have touched something impure. He might have been around, rubbed shoulders with a Gentile or something. So Jesus said, everyone needs to be immersed to prepare the bride for the coming of the bridegroom. And I think in this case, if it took six days to baptize 3,000 people with 300 mikvah, or if it would have done one at a time, John's not laying hands on everyone and baptizing them. They're wading out into the Jordan. Um, But I believe in the case of Jesus, he did, and I'll tell you why. But they're wading out into the Jordan. They're self-immersing, and they're coming out, and John is a witness, and they are now identifying with John and the repentance of sins for the future... uh, Repentance of your sins for the future remission of your sins, either through the scapegoat at Yom Kippur, which we'll talk about next week, or the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And so they're coming out for that. This is the actual picture of today at, um, see that right there? That's Jordan. See that right there? That's Israel. They are that close together. The country of Jordan, the country of Israel. This is 
Bethany, the house of the poor, beyond the Jordan. You go across the Jordan, the Jordan had all these tributaries that went out and there were mikvah pools around those pools. In the days of Jesus, this was a much bigger river. It was clear, it was pristine, it was beautiful because they weren't pumping all the water out and letting it drain back off the fields into the Jordan. By the time you get there today, the most I would do is put my feet in and even my guide said, I don't think I would do that. And yet I'm sitting right there on that little bench by myself and intercoming busloads after busloads after busloads on the Israel side. And people are getting out in their white gowns and they're walking down these steps and they're emerging and the pastors are baptizing them. And what's ironic is they're in Israel and I'm in Jordan and not a single one of them looked at me 30 feet away and said, hey, how is it in Jordan? Or what's going... There's this thing about Jordan and Israel. Jordan and Israel... If you're in Jordan, I don't know if we should even talk to you. It was just the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Plus the fact that they're all getting immersed in the cesspool. This is like your septic tank. Uh, not in the days of John, but the days now. If we ever go to Israel, we're going to go to just where the Jordan leaves the, the Sea of Galilee. And it's pure and it's beautiful. And that's where we'll do our baptisms. Okay, I'll tell you about that place in a minute. Let's see. So, I believe that Jesus came, uh, and in this particular case, he waited out, and John did put his hands on him. And he self-immersed, came back up. The scripture says the heavens were broke open. They, they didn't know if the earth was flat. They talked about the four corners of the earth. They didn't know what the heavens were. They thought they're like this big dome. And up there, there's this track that the sun rises, comes up on, and goes over the track, and then it somehow shuts off and comes back, and the next morning it rises and comes over the track. And that, but it was this solid dome, and it, the Scripture says it broke open, and the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus, and John says it remained on Him. And that is such an important verse, because we're talking about who Jesus was. Did, was He born deity? Did he make birds out of mud and they would fly away? Or was he human because God, he, want, he, he was willing to abandon his deity to become like us and be tempted in every way? But on this occasion, the Spirit of God descended upon him and remained upon him. Um, the, the Isaiah if I can find it, said Isaiah 11.1, 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the root of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him and remain upon him, is what it means. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And that the, the rabbis and the sages said, when we see Messiah, the Spirit of God will be remaining on him, staying on Messiah. And I think John's very careful to point that out. And so from this day forth, we see a different Jesus than we've seen in his life up to this point. He comes out of the water, the Spirit of God descends on him, it remains on him, and we begin to see supernatural things happening that only Messiah could do. And that's what they were expecting. So why, um, so I think John had his hands on him. I think God, when he spoke from heaven, touched him. The Spirit rested on him. And we're not going to go into this today, but only a few rabbis had what they called shmika. And that's our word for that is authority. And remember they came to Jesus and said, where did you get your authority? Because in those days, there was only one way to get authority. Two rabbis who had authority could lay their hands on a rabbi who didn't and, and grant him authority. And a rabbi with authority, with smika, when he would teach, it would be, instead of saying, all the other rabbis would say, well, the scripture says, love your neighbor as yourself. A rabbi with authority would say, this, I say to you, love your neighbor as yourself. So there was a difference in how they presented themselves. And they came to, to uh, Jesus and said, where did you get your authority? And Jesus, do you remember what he said? Well, 
tell me where John got his. And they knew that John had authority from God. He was a special prophet. And all the people believed in John, and all the people knew John had authority from God to introduce the Messiah. And yet they didn't want to admit that Jesus also had authority. But who laid hands on, on, on Jesus on this moment? John did, and God did. I would say both of them had authority and could bestow that on Jesus. So now we have a rabbi who's going to start calling disciples who has authority. So hang on. It'll be fun. So why Bethany beyond the Jordan? Why this spot? They could have baptized anywhere on the Jordan. This is an Elijah place. Elijah was taken up into heaven here and he gave his authority to Elisha. And then Elisha went out to perform twice as many miracles. So people knew if Elijah's coming back, this is where they expected him to start. And this is where Jesus is, or John is baptizing. He's Elijah. And he came to... He must increase, I must decrease. He came to put his authority on Jesus. He came to be the best man to introduce the bridegroom. And that's exactly what's happening in this place. Okay. So, too much. Let's, let's whip through this. I'm just going to go ahead and say, okay... Really important, Mark said, and he preached, saying, after me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. And I, until this week, this is why I like doing this, because God always shows me really incredible things as we peel off more layers. I have never seen this before. I always read this and thought, okay, that's just a statement of humility. John's saying, I'm not even worthy to be his servant and take his sandals off. And I think that's true. But why each of the Gospels included this statement, including John. And John doesn't have much that's in the other Gospels. But he had this statement. And Paul includes it in his, one of his sermons in Acts 13. Well, it turns out that if you, st if you research the removal of sandal, it had to do with the Redeemer the kinsman redeemer, if a wife lost her husband, it was expected that the next of kin would be her redeemer. He would come and take care of her and be her husband and raise up children so that her name could go on. And Deuteronomy 28, it says, if you're not willing to do that, then take off your sandal. If you're going to give up that authority. And then we remember in Ruth chapter 4, Boaz goes to the one who had the right to be the redeemer of Ruth, and he says, I can't do it. And it, Boaz says, well, take off your sandal then, or remove his sandal. And Boaz became the bridegroom of Ruth and redeemed her. John says, they came to John and they said, I'm just gonna, I was going to read the scripture, but we'll start next week there. But they said, John, are, are you Elijah? And he said, no. Well, John, are you the prophet? Remember, they, Moses said they will raise up, God says, I will raise up a prophet like Moses among his people. It was thought to be the Messiah. And John says, nope, not the prophet. Are you the Messiah? And John says, no, I'm not the Messiah. In fact, I'm not worthy to take the sandal off of his foot. In other words, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the bridegroom. He's the redeemer who came and took us, who are desperate. The church is the bride of Christ, and we are the children of that couple. And I just thought, that is so incredible. And then John goes right into the wedding of Cana after that. Isn't that interesting? So next week, we're going to look at us being the bridegroom, I mean, the, the bride of Christ, and what that means, and why he came, and what it meant to be the Redeemer. And I'm just thinking, that is so incredible, this sandal thing. Why did John... Why did, John mentioned that. Why is it in every gospel and why is it in Acts? Because it's important. Because we have to get right from the start that John was the, bride, was the best man. Jesus was the bridegroom. He came to redeem his bride. That's why all the people were immersing to be pure like the bride did before the wedding. So our groom is coming back and there's a certain 
purity and righteousness that we should be striving for. Like the bridesmaids who had prepared themselves for the groom to come, but they ran out of oil. They quit wait. Five did quit waiting, but five are waiting. And as Advent Christians, the Advent of Jesus is the number one thing, really, that is on our heart and in our spirit, is that he is coming back. And I don't think it's too long. And do we want to be prepared or do we just want to sleep? Like that. All right, so the, the sky broke open. And I'll just finish with a couple of thoughts. A voice from heaven. They called that the bat coal. Bat is the word for daughter. Coal is voice. The daughter of the voice. And it had happened a few times in the history of the sages, supposedly. There's about three incidences where the sages got in arguments and then a voice from heaven sided with one sage or the other. And they, they said, when the prophets seized with Malachi, then God spoke directly. But it hardly ever happens. It happens three times to Jesus. It happens here. Do you remember where else? Mount of Transfiguration. And once more at the temple. Um, and, and we'll get to those. So three witnesses uh, again. Anyway, this voice comes from heaven and it said, This is my son, whom I love, and in whom I delight. And if I had time, we'd read each of the scriptures, but that's a direct quote from the Torah, from the Psalms, and from the prophets. Jesus, uh, God's in, in Psalm uh, 8, I believe, God said, This is my son, today I have begotten thee. A well known verse. And then God told Abraham, Take your son whom you love, and sacrifice him. So that's the first time the word love is used in the scriptures is Isaac. So this is my son whom I love. And then Isaiah talks about Messiah when he comes. God says, in him I delight. So even the words of God are linking pearls in scripture together. The law, the prophets, and the, and the Psalms, all three. This is my son, in whom I delight. I love him. And immediately the spirit took over, didn't it? What did he do when he came out of the water? Whoosh! Immediately into the wilderness. These are the Judean hills. I just have this personal little theory um, that he went to Mount Sinai area. Now, traditionally today, Mount Sinai is either in Saudi Arabia or way down the other end of Egypt. But the most logical place for Mount Sinai is a, is a, a mountain in Israel called Har Karkom. And it's in the desert between the Jordan River and Egypt. And, and you, you could walk there in a few days. And I think, uh, I, I think Moses was there for 40 days without eating. Elijah was there for 40 days without eating. Paul went there too, I think in the three years that he was preparing for ministry. So I think, gee, whatever, for reason. But anyway, he's in the wilderness for 40 days. 40 days is a period of testing. We're also in a time in Israel called the 40 days of awe, or the 40 days of repentance. All the people spent 40 days getting their life in order. If I remembered that I had something against Jurgen, or he had something against me, or Larry, I had, in those 40 days, I had to go take care of that. Because at the end of 40 days is Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is when the, scape, the goats, one sacrificed and the other one the sins are put on and he's taken out of the wilderness to take the sins away at the end of 40 days. And if you had repented and if you're, you were right with God, then your name could be written once again in the book of life for yet another year. And so we're in this 40 days. Jesus gets baptized on the first day of this repentance period. Of course people are coming to John. And he comes out and thousands watch him and he immediately goes into the wilderness. And there he's tempted by Satan. And I think this is the worst temptation that Satan ever leashed on mankind of any way. Daniel talked about the angel came and said, I tried to come to you, but Satan... Uh, the prince of Persia resisted me and it took all these days for me to get to you, but I'm here now. And I think Satan unleashed everything on, the, on Messiah because he's starting to see what's going on here. 
And he's going to first try to attack Messiah, and then he'll attack the leadership to not believe in him and not accept him. And he's very successful at that. But that's lessons away. So he gets tempted in three ways. He says, um, took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the nations of the, land, of the world. Well, this is like Moses. God took Moses, the first redeemer, up and showed him everything. He said, but you don't get to go. Now, Jesus, I think, maybe is up on Mount Nebo, and somehow, miraculously, he sees all the nations of the world, and Satan says, I own these. I'm in charge of these nations, but I can give them to you. But Jesus knows that's a lie, and he, he counters that with Scripture. And then Satan takes him to the top of the temple, 160 feet up. Jump off. The Lord your God says in the Scripture, he will give his angels charge over you, and they will catch you. And Jesus says, you're not to put the Lord your God to a test. And then, after 40 days, he's really, really hungry. And if this is the 40th day of the, fa of the repentance, it's Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is the only mandated fast day in Israel. No man, woman, or child is eating anything on this day. And Satan says, ah, turn these rocks to, to bread. And he says, man shouldn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Satan left him. And angels ministered to him. And, fed, uh, and then after the, the 40 days, he ate. And he was strengthened, and he began his ministry, and that's where we're going to take up next week. But the Holy Spirit is on him, remains upon him, and he's coming for his bride, and we need to be ready, and we need to be excited, and that's what I have today. So you are it, we are it, and we're all in this together, and Lord, come quickly. Lord, I just want to pray for all of us here that this word will take seed in our heart, that we will just... Rejoice in being chosen by you that you kept your sandal on and you are our redeemer and you came for us and you redeemed us and you bought us with your blood and you're coming back for us. And we praise you. We ask for your extra portion of your Holy Spirit to be upon us this week, to be light to the world, to be a ray of sunshine, um, to glorify you in all we do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so there you are, the bride of Christ.